It's budget week. I know you've had it marked in your calendar for months. Rishi Sunak certainly will. He's all too aware it's one of the last moments pre-election to change the political weather. Could extra tax cuts give him a bit of headwind? Clear the dark clouds that, according to polls at least, forecast a decent chunk of voters ditching him for Labour? But should he also keep his eye on the latest Farage faction, reform? They may be small in number, they may be polling only at 10%, but the impact that's having on the Conservative Party is seismic. Reform UK is a small, populist political party set up by Nigel Farage, but led by the little-known businessman called Richard Tice. We're delighted with our best two ever by-election results in Kingswood at just 10.4%, 13% in Wellingborough. And it's got the Conservative Party's attention. Uh, we can now reveal that Lee Anderson met with Richard Tice, the leader of the Reform UK party. We don't know what they discussed, but the timing is very, very telling, I think, 24 hours after he lost the whip. There's even still a question over whether Lee Anderson might switch to reform. But why exactly has a political party that has never stood in a general election, let alone won one, got the Tories so worried? You're listening to Stories of Our Times from The Times and The Sunday Times. I'm Luke Jones. Today, why Rishi Sunak should be worried about the rise of reform. Hi, I'm Harry York and I'm the Deputy Political Editor of The Sunday Times. Have you been following this particular slice of the British political spectrum for a while? Yes, I have, yeah. I mean, I've been following the story of reform since its inception in 2021. But before that, when it was the Brexit party, I covered that at the Telegraph for a number of years. And obviously before that, you had UKIP. So this has been a long running saga. So when did you think you first met Farage? I think that was probably when he just left UKIP or when he was setting up the Brexit party. I felt that something absolutely fundamental had broken. Trust in politics, trust in our entire political system. And that is why I founded the Brexit Party, to restore that faith. And uh, it was kind of the, his comeback after the wilderness years from UKIP and the Brexit referendum, and he was looking to relaunch a new party during the malaise of Theresa May's premiership when Brexit looked like it wasn't going to get done. Yes. And that was the moment, really, that, yeah, he came back to the forefront of politics. And from my outsider's perspective, they seem like a particularly interesting bunch. If you look at the full spread of politicians, they, I don't know, they seem like they make particularly exciting copy for someone like you. Yes, it's that, that is certainly true. Reform is full of very colourful people. And so was the Brexit Party before it and UKIP before. And I think the, the reality of that is because all three of those entities were set up as protest parties. And if you're a protest party, you're not part of it, and you're anti-establishment or how they like to brand themselves, mm. you're not speaking to the same audience and you're not necessarily trying to convey the same messages. And and these people are generally seen as outsiders. I mean, now, Nigel Farage has made his entire political career out of being seen to be an outsider, somebody who speaks for the common people against the establishment. So, yeah, naturally, that's going to attract some interesting people, I mm. think. Would you say reform, as this bunch now are, has done particularly well in by-elections of late? I'm thinking in Wellingborough in Northamptonshire, and then the one before that was Kingswood in Gloucestershire, was it? I mean, have they done a particularly good showing recently? Well, they have recently, and I think it's just worth dialing back to when it started. So, obviously, it was previously the Brexit Party. Now, with Farage stepping aside and Richard Tice, its new leader, coming in, it was a relatively unknown entity. People weren't quite sure what it stood for, what were its ideals, what were its policies. So for the first two years, it kind of limped along and it didn't perform well. Uh, there's been a lot of by-elections and they've been basically cleaned up by the Lib Dems and Labour and reform has been basically been non-existent. And that was also the case in the national polls. But in the last 12 months, that started to change since Boris Johnson's exit from number 10 and the seeming shift of the Conservative Party away from that kind of pro-Brexit zeal towards more centrist policies, more commonly associated with Theresa May and David Cameron. And that's now changed the picture. So yes, to go to the last 
month or so, reform has really arrived on the national stage. We saw in Wellingborough, reform achieved 13% in that by-election, which is its highest ever vote share. And it also secured 10% of the vote in Kingswood. So that's, that is now a double digit breakthrough for them. And it's confirming what is now being shown in the polls, which they're consistently hitting 10%. And, and Nigel Farage has said recently that this is the arrival of reform as a, as a real force in British politics. And, and actually, if you look now, they're consistently polling above the Lib Dems. So, so it is an impressive turn of events. And thinking about their origin story, is it pretty much the same people who ran UKIP, ran the Brexit party, and then it became reform? Or has it altered much throughout then? So there is a familiar theme. I think a lot of the people who were in UKIP aren't necessarily part of the equation now. But people who were part of the Brexit party, a lot of those people were basically ex-conservatives. We had the likes of Anne Widdicombe, for example, a former yes. Tory minister. Uh, she was part of the Brexit party fold. She's now part of reform. There's the deputy leader, Ben Habib, another Tory voter uh, who's been involved in the Conservative Party. He fell out of love with the Conservatives over Brexit. He felt they weren't hardline enough on that. He was a Brexit party MEP, and now he's back. And obviously, running throughout... The, the, all three of those parties have been Nigel Farage at the forefront, driving and pioneering these parties. And Tice comes into the fold in about 2019. Mm. So when the Brexit parties formed, Richard Tice at that point was a Tory donor. He'd been a Tory donor for a, a number of years, but he was drawn to Farage's appeal on this single issue of Brexit. And he felt like Farage that Theresa May and the Conservatives were selling out on Brexit. So that's where he came in. And ever since then, it's basically been Farage and Tice. So in the present day, we've got Farage's what? What's he? He's the honorary president. Honorary president. Richard Tice is the... He is the leader. The leader of the party. Where did he come from? Who is he? Well, he was basically until recently, a, a, not, a relatively unknown entity. The Tories, sadly, have broken Britain. But be under no illusion whatsoever. Labour will bankrupt Britain. It's only Reform UK's common sense policies that can now save Britain. Tyson's background is in business. He started off as a, as a property manager. He moved into property asset management uh, and he was very successful. I mean, he's a more sanitised version of Nigel Farage. He's the kind of person you could see standing for the Tories in a southern safe seat. They'll sort of look at him and think, nice man. Well, I think that was the appeal. Yes, I think that's the appeal of Tice. As a sidebar note, the party is a limited company. Yeah, it's a very interesting structure, which a lot of people will not be aware of. So Unlike other political parties, Reform, as you say, is effectively a private company. Mm. And what that means in practice is basically it has a share structure. Mm. And the reason why it has that is because when Nigel Farage set up the Brexit party mm. in 2018, he did so wanting to change the bits of UKIP that he didn't like. And what re used to drive Farage mad about UKIP was all the internal warfare, the positioning, etc. And even sometimes attempts to, to kind of alienate him, to push him out as, as there was all this kind of internal jostling. So what he did is he thought, I'm going to create something over which I have total and utter control. So he created the Brexit party, a private limited company, and he created 15 shares. And he has a majority shareholding. So he has eight of those 15 shares. And Richard Tice has five. So it is odd. Basically, what happens is that reform members, they can pay a £25 membership fee, which allows them to participate in all of its events. But they don't actually have the same stake in the party as maybe members of the Conservative Party or the Labour Party. And more importantly, Nigel Farage is the honorary president and he's taken kind of a back seat for the last few years. But through his majority shareholding, he actually still exercises, should he wish to use it, control technically of how reform would work. Mm. So for example, hypothetically, if Farage did want to return and wanted to become leader, I think the way the company is structured would enable him to do that. And, and similarly, he basically can make quite major decisions 
exercising that 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 shareholding. So yeah. that is a weird structure, and actually, quite a few of the senior figures in reform are privately a bit uncomfortable with it because one of the things we, you have to understand about reform is that, and the reason why it took so long for them to get going again, is because in 2019 at the general election, the Brexit Party made a very costly decision for them to stand down half of their candidates in conservative seats. And that was seen at the time as a huge concession to, to Boris Johnson. I think privately, a lot of people around Nigel Farage regret that they did that. But for m the candidates who stood for the Brexit party, it was seen as a big betrayal. And a lot of them blame Farage. So many of those people are now back in reform. And what they're concerned about is if Farage comes back, will he start making the same types of unilateral decisions without consulting the party? Which so, he can do because of the Which structure. he can do. Now, I should say that longer term, there are discussions currently taking place in reform about democratising it, turning it after the next election into a proper party, just like Labour and the Conservatives. But, but in the meantime, in order to get some of these figures back into the party, and the, the two people who spring to mind are Ben Habib, the deputy leader, and Anne Widdicombe, who I've already mentioned, Richard Tice actually had to provide written guarantees to them that henceforth any decisions, major decisions about policy or election campaigning would have to be made by consultation with his top team uh, and the party rather than it being done unilaterally. And, and the most important issue for them was actually this, this issue about are we going to stand against the Tories in 2024 in every seat or are we going to cave again for maybe some sort of benefit for Nigel Farage. Mm. And he has basically given, in, uh, almost written in blood, those cast iron guarantees that they will stand. But but as you say, that is a really interesting dynamic and, and I'm not sure where it ultimately ends. And it all depends in, in large part on whether Nigel Farage returns. Because in terms of the literal control of the party and in terms of who can capture the public imagination more than anyone else, Farage is top dog. Yes, that's right. And while some of the people in reform currently are very keen to keep Tice as, as the leader because they think he's more democratic, they feel like he's more willing to, to create policy and run the party by consultation, there are big players who are not currently in reform but are associated with it who are very much agitating for Farage to come back as leader. Thinking about their current pitch, though, what is their manifesto? Because I guess UKIP had an issue. The Brexit Party had an issue. For Reform UK, I mean, what are they reforming? What, what, what do they say needs to change? Well, that's the big challenge for them. And that was the concern about the name when it was renamed Reform. Hmm. It Was it too vague? Did it really actually speak to anything? The, the beauty of UKIP and Brexit Party is you knew exactly what it stood for straight hmm. away, whereas reform could mean many things to many people. So Richard Tice is now trying to put flesh on the bones to, hmm. to give definition to reform. And a couple of weekends ago at a conference, he announced what he's calling a contract with the people, which he won't allow journalists to, to call it this, but it is an, a manifesto effectively. Hmm. It, it, it is effectively one gargantuan tax cut okay. uh, on the one hand. So, so what Richard Tice is is proposing is huge sweeping cuts to income tax, which would see um, the, the the kind of tax thresholds surge. So for the basic rate of income tax, you wouldn't pay any income tax below 20,000. And it's currently at 12 and a half or something. And it's currently at 12 and a half. And then for, for higher rate taxpayers, it would go up to 70,000 from about 50,000 now. Mm. And then on top of that, he's calling for sweeping cuts to inheritance tax, corporation tax. There are a lot of tax cuts built in there. And, and if you think Liz Truss's mini budget was radical, then Richard Tice has got something else for you. And mentioning Liz Truss there, is his pitch all tied up with, we are proper Tories, we are proper Conservatives and the Conservatives Party aren't currently? Yes, that is exactly what Reform's pitch is. Reform's pitch is that the Conservative Party is no longer Conservative. Mm. Uh, they've abandoned their ideals, they've, they've shifted too much to the centre, they would say to the left. And this is their appeal. It's low tax, fat right ideals. And then there's, but then you've got the populist elements, the, the kind of UKIP, Brexit party 
stuff coming in as well. So this this contract with the people that he announced was also looking at the subject of immigration, mm. another area that Farage exploited very controversially, but some would say successfully in 2016 during the referendum. So that's been an issue that has caused nightmares for Rishi Sunak in number 10. And what f- what Tice is calling for is basically very radical proposals to take the UK out of the European Convention on Human Rights. That is something that some right-wing Tory MPs are very keen to do. So again, he's playing to that gallery. He also wants basically a total ban on any illegal migrants who come to the UK from being settled here. So they would all be returned to their country of origin, Mm -hmm. which obviously on the surface sounds great to certain voters, but in reality is incredibly complicated. And probably most controversially, and I would say this is taken directly from Farage's playbook, he wants to basically start a huge diplomatic fight with France by by insisting that any any boats that are intercepted in the channel carrying migrants would be turned around and sent back to France. I think the reality is that what he wants to do there is create a political argument which involves um, bashing the French, which has obviously always played quite well for Eurosceptics in the past. Mm. But in essence, this is a big populist manifesto. There are lots of holes in it, and I, and I don't think Tice shies away from the fact that there are holes in it. But he's gone early and he's gone early because he knows that the Conservative Party is having an identity crisis right now and he wants to get his policies out there to get people talking about them. So we have talked about reform, reform policies, but who are they targeting? Because presumably they don't expect to do well everywhere. Is it simply just places where UKIP has done well in the past? Well, you'd expect that because for smaller parties, for example, the Lib Dems, they have very specific target seats. Hmm. The reality is that reform, or so I'm told, is reform is going to go into the next election without a list of target seats. They actually are going to stand in every seat in Great Britain, not Northern Ireland, but 630 seats in England, Wales and Scotland. And the way it's been characterised to me, their strategy is basically they want to zone in on those candidates that they think are most likely to resonate with local people. I don't really know what that means in practice, but presumably people who are a bit almost built in Farage's image, who can go give a a speech in a local pub and and talk to the voters that they feel other politicians don't connect with. And so uh, this is, this is, I think, in its infancy, but it sounds like the strategy is, let's see how our different candidates play out. Let's see how they perform in the media at the beginning. And if they look like they've got a good shot of winning, then we'll throw all of our resources into those seats and hope that we we win. But the reality is that right now, even though they're the talk of the town and they're doing well in the polls, because of the first past the post system, they're not on track to win any seats right now. Mm. Is success in their strategy winning seats or is it threatening Tories in certain areas and hoping to influence Tory policy? I think it's it's the latter. They genuinely, I, I've had a number of conversations with Ty's Nigel Farage, but a number of the other people in the party at the high, high, higher up end. Mm. And, and I generally get the sense that they're quite realistic about how they're going to perform. I mean, they're hopeful that they could win a few seats to give them that platform longer term. But I think they they genuinely are driven by this conviction that the Conservative Party has failed, uh, that they feel that the Conservative Party betrayed the ideals that they stood on as the Brexit Party in 2019. And therefore, this is about, now they might deny this, but it feels like it's about retribution. And you've heard Richard Tice say this publicly about wiping out the Conservative Party. But they say that knowing full well that in doing so, they may hand the keys of Downing Street to Keir Starmer and not only hand the keys to him, but give him an even bigger majority than he's currently on course to win. So what do they say to that charge then? Because that's something that Rishi Sunak has said, a vote for reform is just going to hand the keys to, to Keir Starmer to number 10. Well, that's also interesting because they're actually inherently relaxed about that. And their argument is that it's impossible because of the success of the Brexit Party that UKIP and that mm. reform have had, it's impossible for, for Keir Starmer to take the UK back into the European Union. That is just not a conversation that Britain is prepared to have. And therefore, given that's their number one issue, they're quite relaxed because they say that there is very little, there's a cigarette paper between Keir Starmer and Rishi Sunak. So as far as they're concerned, if they can 
if they can change the nature of the debate in this country, if they mm. can shift the Conservative Party post-election to their framing of politics, they will have achieved what they set out to achieve. And that's their hope. But how likely is that? I mean, you said in the in the Wellingborough by-election we had in Northamptonshire, they won 13% of the vote. Was that all Tory votes, do we think? And how are they polling in terms of nibbling away at Tory votes? Well, that's what's quite fascinating is it's not it's not an exact science. So we, we don't know precisely how the, the breakdown of the vote split. But what I can tell you is that there's been some very interesting analysis done recently by a think tank called More in Common, which gives you a good idea of where reforms votes coming from. So this analysis, which was based on recent surveys, found that about 59% of reforms vote nationally is coming from people who voted Tory in 2019. Oh, okay. And only 5% is coming from Labour. But what will concern the Conservatives a lot about those results is that they are hoping, the whole strategy of the Conservative Party is that they've had these bad by-elections and reform is on the, the march. But between now and the general election, there is every chance that reform will blow itself up, that something bad will happen, one of their candidates will say something atrocious or, or it will just, the public will get wise to reform. But what the more in common analysis shows is that if, if reform were to cease as an entity tomorrow, actually those 59% of Tory voters who make up that vote, they're not actually all going to go back to the Conservative Party. In fact, the, the analysis suggests just three out of every 10 Tory switches to reform would actually go back to the Conservatives. And the rest of them would either not vote or vote for Labour or a smaller party. So that actually shows you that whatever reform's done here to the Conservative Party, there's not a, an easy solution to stop the bleeding. And in fact, even if they successfully neuter reform now, that, that damage is done. Mm. It can't be reversed. So, and, and the logic, the logical response to that would be, some might say, in fact, some are urging, which is going to do, is to tack right, follow the example of what reform is saying and win those voters back. Yeah, that's right. There are, and th this is the thing, that reform is, is really, really causing problems internally in the Conservative Party. There, a lot of backbench MPs the biggest fears that they have right now are not Keir Starmer, but Richard Tice and Nigel Farage. What are they doing? Uh, how do our voters perceive what they're doing? And you have seen after those by-elections the other week, we saw that lots of Conservative MPs on the right came out after that, after those two defeats. And they were saying that we need to shift our policies further to the right. We need to shift on immigration. We need to shift on tax. And... And their hope is that if they were to mirror what Tice is doing, that might change the picture. But the problem for, for the Conservative Party is that you have another strand of opinion, the more moderate wing of the party, and these are people who are representing more kind of traditional shire seats or southeast seats and southwest west seats, who are saying, if we do this and we shift further to the right, what we're actually going to end up doing is we're not going to uh, see those voters return to us they're gone. But what we are going to do is we're going to alienate the voters we still have. You know, the moderate conservatives, the one nation mm -hmm. conservatives, the people who kind of flocked to David Cameron in 2015 and 2010. We're going to alienate those people and then we may drive those people inadvertently to Labour or the Lib Dems. And there you could start to see in the so-called blue wall, we talk a lot about the, the red wall of seats in the North and the Midlands, you might start to see seats, formerly safe Tory seats, starting to go to the Lib Dems and Labour because of that. Mm. One of the reasons why Rishi Sunak has been seemingly all over the place of his messaging in re recently is because I, I think he's tr struggling to work out what direction to take the party in. We see, we've seen on one hand the Conservative Party row back on some of its net zero policies, which again is something reform is pushing on. And it's been very tough and hardline on immigration, obviously through the Rwanda policy. But then on the other side, we're seeing more kind of centrist policies coming through the, um, the, the age ban on smoking. I think the reality is that he, they don't have a coherent message right now. And he's, he's struggling to find an identity. One thing that could really shake this up is Nigel Farage 
getting off his honorary president perch and appointing himself leader, saying we're going to stand for reform in a in a Westminster seat. Do you think that would really put the rocket boosters up, what we're already seeing? Yes, absolutely. And that's something that pollsters think as well. You know, I've had a number of conversations with various um, pollsters and, and experts on this. I, I, I think if Nigel Farage came back now, the, the, the kind of smart money is that you could see their their vote potentially go up, their vote share go up to potentially between 15 and 20%. So why isn't he doing that? Is he hedging his bets thinking a changed Tory party might want me? I, I wish I knew the answer <laughs> because I'd have a great story to write this weekend. Yeah. I, I think the reality is that what Nigel Farage is is a master of timing and he loves the theatre. He loves the fact that every newspaper in the country, every broadcaster is writing and speculating on what's he going to do? Is he going to come back to lead reform? Mm. Or on the other hand, is he going to write to the rescue and become, after 20 years as a pariah, is he going to become the saviour for the Conservative Party by coming in and shifting it to the right and potentially even leading it after the next election? I think he loves that. I think it's building up his presence again with voters. He's part of a national conversation. And so you have to ask the question, why would he at this point make a decision? I think he is a master at, as I said, letting things play out, letting the story and the narrative, and politics is so much about narrative, mm. develop. And then once he's seen the optimum moment, that's when he will decide what to do. My money currently, just based on the signals that he's sending, the fact that he's calling on Lee Anderson to defect to reform, is that he will at some point probably be convinced to come back to lead reform. But then again, saying that, he might he may take the third option, which is to continue with his very lucrative media career. And um, who knows, obviously he's already been on I'm a Celebrity, but I'm sure there are various other yeah. reality, reality TV pursuits that there's he could... Strictly uh, Dancing on Ice, there's, yeah, there's a whole list of them. Haven't we been here before? I'm thinking particularly with UKIP. We were having the same kind of conversations about Tory voters leaving the fold and going off elsewhere or how UKIP might impact the Conservative Party and how they might tack the right, try and save those voters. Is this the same thing happening again or is it the same thing but with a greater order, order of magnitude? Well, politics is, especially in this country, is quite cyclical. So to say, is this a, a repeat of history? Yes, I think it, it, mm. we've seen it before. We saw it with UKIP. Reform are not as doing as well currently as UKIP did, and we have to remind ourselves of that. Their polling results are not as impressive as UKIP's were, you know, in 2015. Mm. Um, I think the bigger picture that you're you're asking about is, yes, it does feel very familiar, but but the, the Conservative Party is in a different place to where it was in 2015. Uh, in 2015, David Cameron had kind of lanced the UKIP boil for a while because he'd already promised a referendum on Europe. He mm. promised that back in 2013 and it was part of the election campaign. And that had satisfied quite a lot of Eurosceptics. They were finally going to get their vote on, on the question that had dogged the UK for, for 20 years. What's different now is that I don't think Rishi Sunak has an answer. He hopes that the answer is an improved economy and also that his Rwanda legislation finally gets through and that they start to see flights take off to Rwanda. But everybody you speak to in Westminster is not convinced that's going to happen. And you could end up with a situation where, again, even when this legislation clears the commons, the, the policy is, is held up again in court and through legal challenges. And then so he goes into an election with no clear answer to what reform is calling for. And, and that's the difference. And secondly... With David Cameron, the Conservative Party was still neck and neck with the Labour Party. You know, the 2015 slim majority that Cameron won was a surprise. The issue now is that the Conservative Party is so far behind Labour, it's already on course to lose potentially 150 seats. The story of reform now is the story of potentially Tory wipeout and just how bad that could be. In, in a year's time? And could we be looking at a fundamental change in this country if the most dominant party in our history is reduced to, let's say, 140 MPs? And then, in the aftermath of that result, 
the Conservative Party fundamentally changes its entire outlook. In effect, it becomes a chameleon and seeks to latch onto the, ref the reform programme that proved so successful leading up to the election. So that, I think, is why this is such a fascinating development. You've been listening to Stories of Our Times, a podcast brought to you thanks to subscribers of The Times and The Sunday Times. With me, Luke Jones, and my guest, the Deputy Political Editor at The Sunday Times, Harry York. If you want to find out the latest on political manoeuvring and gossip and insider Westminster workings, you can read all of Harry's reporting at thetimes.co.uk or in print on Sundays. The producer today was Priyanka Deladia. The executive producer is Kate Ford. And sound design was by Tom Birchall. If you have a story that you think we should be covering, maybe some comments, critiques, compliments, storiesofourtimes at thetimes.co.uk is how to email us. Goodbye. <laughs>